well, oh my gosh, everybody's in. This is awesome. Thank you for joining us today. I love this. Um, and let me do this. I'm going to switch to a gallery. I love to see who's here. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many people. Julie, Crystal, Kristen, Dawn, Romy. Um, we've got Sarah on here. Um, Joanne, Karen, Jackie, Annette, Susan, Sandra, Stephanie. Oh my gosh, Laura, Lisa, Baba Squarey. Yes, Betty Niederberger. Yes, there we go. Okay. We're really happy to have you guys here tonight. I'm Sarah Cooperman. I'm the CEO of SCW. Usually I'm wearing a scarf or some business shirt, but the three of us that are on the webinar tonight, we're actually doing exercises before we turned on. We have over 300 people that are registered. We've already got 55 of you that have logged in and we're expecting about 80 live. So I'd love you to move your mouse, go to the chat box if you would, and type in where you're from and what your name is. Usually we can tell, but um, we'd love to know who's, where you're coming in from. And also we want you to be able to use the chat box. We wanna know what questions you have. This is your webinar. Um, we find that we have about 80 people that are coming live, but interestingly enough, we always have over a hundred that are listening to the podcast. So I want you to know that we're always here for you and we love different modalities. Um, I've got th uh, two wonderful presenters with me today. Unfortunately, Chris Geller couldn't make it. I think his wife unfortunately got into a car accident. I'm a little worried about that. Abby Apple actually is the author of, our, of SDW's new stretch certification. She's a, rec, um, she's a recreational therapist and the owner of Abby Fit. She has led our bar certification. She leads our Pilates certification and write them. She's, in the, she's also a Schwinn trainer. Um, she is certified by just about everybody this, like in the world. Um, so we're very thankful that Abby's here tonight. And she also put, she took off she took off her pajama pants and she's wearing tights because she promised she'll demonstrate some stuff with us. See, and Andrew, Andrew took off his tights and put on his pajama pants. So he's going to show you some stuff. Andrew Gavigan is a wonderful presenter. He actually is getting his degree in psychology. Yay. I think you get it in April, right, Andrew? Yes, yeah. Ma'am. Very cool. And, um, you're a recognized speaker in the fitness industry, a master trainer. You were director of education for Active Solutions. He's the founder of Most Fit, which is a small line of unique workout equipment. He's a NASM and NFPT certified personal trainer and a behavioral health club and workplace wellness um, expert. So we're really excited to have Andrew here. Um, we've got Adam Budagavali, who is running our webinar tonight. Um, so I am looking here. I love to see this stuff. Um, I see that we've got people here from Atlanta, New York, Massachusetts, Georgia. Um, it, it's wonderful. I really appreciate you guys joining us. Be sure to type in any questions you have. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is glute training perfecting your posterior. So it's the whole posterior chain and the, and the gluteals. And we know that this is a very important area. So we, you know, our webinars, we have 45 minutes to go and I do less than five minute introductions. So we're off and running. How can we coach our clients to properly engage and train their glutes and hamstrings? Abby. Abby. Oh, it's Abby's first. Abby um, first. Here we go. A. Let's go with me. Um, well, I train, I train mostly women, as I said earlier, mostly women who uh, most of the most worry, you know, worry are concerned with the aesthetics of their glutes, what they look like. And, and I totally give, you know, from that perspective, I also feel the same way. And I do tell them that the first thing, if you want your glutes to look better. You have to make sure that they function better. So 
and making sure that they function better means that they have to learn how to activate them for all of those, you know, the, the quintessential lower body exercises that we do. So your squats and your lunges, a lot of people mindlessly move through those exercises. So get getting them to move more intentionally after they activate those muscles is what I'm always, um, you know, recommending and promoting with my clients. Excellent. And Andrew, thought? Uh, yes. Now activations, I think is the key word, especially with the glutes muscles that help to support most of the movement we do throughout the day, even when we're seated. Um, and I'm an advocate for starting training programs with new clients or even uh, individual workouts with our clients by activating certain muscles, especially the muscles we're going to utilize in that workout. Or if it's just a full body functional workout, I want to try to make sure that they've activated their glutes, their core, some of their upper back muscles, and especially some of the muscles that they may have historically found to be weaker. Um, you can do things that are super low impact, incrementally build up their ability to consciously engage their glutes fully as to avoid injuries and imbalances that they may suffer or may already have suffered for a long time, which is why they came to see you. Once you've activated their glutes, then they can start to learn those bigger exercises, apply resistance and build some strength, build some muscle. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, we always focus on, on how we look. That's the way we started our fitness programs. Like so we think about how do our arms look? How does our chest look? What is, do I have a six pack? I feel like now, you know, at my age, I have a little small pony keg, but then, and, and the quads, okay? Because we can't see the back of us. So I always think of training like a two to one ratio, almost doubly training the back, trying to focus on the back and on the glutes and on the hamstrings because I think we overemphasize our quads, our hip flexors, our abs, and our chest. Do you, do you see that, Abby, with your clients? I see that. Yeah, definitely. No, I definitely see it. So like with, with the classes that I teach, I think, you know, we're so, again, going back to the aesthetics, we're so focused on what we look like. And so many people can't, I hate to say, they can't see the back. I'm like, I'm looking, I see you as you walk away. I'm watching now. I mean, I, I'm not, and I hate to say, I'm not judging them. What I'm doing is I'm evaluating them. I'm evaluating their gait. I'm evaluating their posture. And I almost immediately can tell, you know, somebody who doesn't train their back. I mean, I, there was, there's a person I were, we were, I was, you know, joking. There was a celebrity um, years ago who was singing at the Grammys. And we were talking about how great the front looks. Everybody's so focused on getting a six pack. And she turned around, like the front looked awesome. I mean, it was like ripped because she was wearing a little half top and she turned around and, and she did have a butt, by the way, but the back of her body was flat. Like she had no muscle tone in the back of her shoulders, um, in her middle back. Like you could tell that she only trains the aesthetics of, of, um, you know, of her body, just how it looks. And that will, again, that will come back, I think later on. For most people, kind of to bite you, bite you, in, pardon the phrase, bite you in the butt. But it will definitely, it will come back to get you. So, right, it will definitely come back to get most people. I mean, it, it, that's how I trained for years and years and years. I trained the aesthetics of fitness. And then I learned, you know, yeah. as you get older, the young yeah. and dumb, I learned the appropriate rate to train because I couldn't maintain, I couldn't sustain that type of training. You've got to train a little more holistically, the front the back, and I always come back to this and I might say it again, but if you want your glutes to look better, not only do you have to get them the function, but I think we've already talked about this, the whole posterior chain, and I'm doing this because your back muscles, your lats and your glutes are connected by fascia, that posterior oblique sling that we have. So if you don't train your back, especially your lats, the posterior chain, the whole thing, your, gla your glutes will never I love it. We'll never reach their potential. And I say that you'll never reach your glute potential if you don't train your back. And that's kind of the way that I scare my clients into training their back. Fear. Yeah. That's fear. Wonderful. I use fear. It works. I use fear. I know. What a, you know, screw positive reinforcement. I'm going, no. I'm going for the fear factor. Um, I have the fun. Exactly. My husband would have a heart attack if he knew I was going to tell. I got to share it though. So the only time my husband's ever been arrested, he was in, he was in New Orleans and he actually bent down and 
spit this girl perfect butt. And the, and the police were there. My husband got arrested. Isn't it lovely? He had to declare it when he took the bar exam. This is lovely. All right. I'm, I'm sure he's pleased at this. All right. Joanne, actually, uh, Zolodaz says she's from Germantown, Maryland. She says, I'm really looking forward to this <laughs> webinar. Will I look like Abby after this? So like my goal is to have Abby Apple's ass. Okay. That's my goal. Just a personal uh, you know, a person, yeah, Andrew's going to help me get there. But I, I don't have a, a big butt, but I've got to do what type of training, Andrew, you heard Abby talking about the fascia connection. And I know you just, you're just totally into it. How is training my fascia, working with it, stretching it out, manipulating it, going to assist me to better train my glutes? Sure. So um, I've been doing this for 18 years now. And even in that time, which I know I'm the, the, the most uh, rookie trainer on this panel right now. Um, even in that what time, I say? I'm trying to say you guys are both beautiful and smart <laughs> compared to me. Yeah, we know um, what you're really saying. What I'm trying to say is you guys know a lot. And I'm also yeah. trying to suggest that what we know as a whole has changed dramatically even in 18 years, especially about fascia. So when I became a trainer, fascia was a sausage casing that held your muscles together. But what fascia really is, is it's a um, tissue or it's an organ, they call it, that covers the outside of all of your muscle groups, all of your muscle fibers, all of your organs. It has contractile elements to it. It has um, nervous system elements, meaning that it actually helps to send signals. And some people think it does a lot for proprioception, for the ability for my foot to know where my hand is, for example. So activations by doing hip extensions or forward folds in yoga class or activations by doing the foam roller on my glutes and my lower back both help to get my muscles primed to react and to work and to engage when I want them to. So activations and warmups like that, that affect both our musculature and the other organs and tissues in our body are all going to help you whilst you move through life or move through a workout. So we want to focus on those things just as much as we want to focus on nutrition, water, and um, bar squats. Now, I love the way you say activation because I think, you know, when we're rolling out, we think, what are we doing? We're like, you know, compressing tissue. It, it brings heat to the area and it also increases circulation, which you're, and you're saying that will also affect contractile strength of the musculature, correct? Yes. Yeah. So supposedly our fascia has elastic and contractile elements to it that help us move, help us maintain balance. Then it also has an effect now. So like Sarah mentioned, my, my expertise is in behavior and psychology. So I recently had to write a paper on a somewhat recent um, research uh, article about sufferers of um, depressive disorder and the effects of myofascial rolling on their affect. Affect essentially means mood. And um Turns out, unsurprisingly, probably to most of us, that myofascial release or fascial massage has a positive effect on acute and long-lasting affect on various sufferers of depressive disorder and people who don't suffer from depressive disorder, which is, for example, myself. If I did foam rolling this morning, it has a positive effect on my affect. And it helps me to move and engage muscles more thoroughly. So we get sort of a two birds with one stone there. Oh, that's nice. And that's good for us. Um, when, we, when we talk about the foam rolling, Abby, um, uh, are you a foam roller? Do you do it before you work out? Are you doing it after your workout? And it, <clears throat> are you working on the posterior chain while you're using uh, a roller yeah. or whatever I type do. of device? 
I actually, you know, I actually included it in, it's in the um, stretching cert. So we have a little segment of that in there um, for the group portion of it. But um, for myself, because I have injuries and if some of you don't know this, I did fitness competitions. Bob knows this, Bob Esquire is on the call. I did fitness competitions. I won my pro card. Like it was, I was seriously into this, but I have the injuries to prove it, like serious injuries that have created a horrible imbalance in my hips, horrible and like knee issues. And so I've got one glued and not only that I fell down the stairs once. So I've got like muscle damage. So I, my one glute just does not turn on until I foam roll it. So I roll it out before I ever do any glute training. So I, you see me, or I, I mean, I hate to say this, if I don't have a foam roller, you'll see me like rubbing up against a wall just to activate, like on the corner of the wall to get my glute on one side, just to turn on. So, and that does help. And I, you know, I, I, from, from the origin of the muscle all the way to the insertion of the muscle, I activate and I, you want to do it evenly, but I focus specifically on the glute that doesn't want to turn on so that when I get into the training, they both turn on together. And you know, what's interesting is you talk about your falling. Everybody's got injuries. Um, everybody, everybody's had a fall. Everybody's done something to their body, especially as we get older. We've just got, we've had more time to fall down. Um, I injured my knee and it actually, part of it is because of my, my left glute wasn't firing. So I've had to retrain and I find it very fascinating. Now we did get an interesting question from Gail Moore. Gail says that she works with clients who are 50 plus, both male and female. And she's wondering about how our posterior chain issues are, I think, affected as we age. And I think, Andrew, I threw that question at you before we turned the camera on. I was talking about older adults because I feel like as we age, we just, you know, we lose whole motor units as we age. So they just start atrophying and we lose fast twitch muscle fibers um, much more quickly than we use slow twitch. So Abby's raising her hand. All right, Andrew. Yeah, you go, I raise my hand because I don't want to interrupt, but go ahead, Andrew, go first and then I'll, and I'll add on to that when you're done. Sure. So, so my personal clientele is all over 50 with the exception of one client um, at this point. Uh, and I have been with a lot of them since they were in their 40s. But even at that point, like myself, I spent a lot of time forward. Uh, I know we make, uh, by the way, as a side note, a lot of comments on on, on current society and how we're, we're so forward and hunched over and we use our phones and we're anteriorly translated. I would argue that peoples have been anterior translated for the history of at least the agricultural revolution the last past 12,000 years. Um, and I'm going to give you guys a good uh, book recommendation in the comments here that talks about what sitting was like before chairs had backs and what work was like before we sat on computers. But nonetheless, um, as much as we mentioned earlier that people overtrain maybe their interior parts of their body for aesthetic reasons, which by the way, Aesthetic reasons, just as great as any other reason, I think, maybe most important reasons to exercise, totally different conversation. But simply our day-to-day -day life, our, our uh, functional living brings us forward a lot more if we're not conscious or cognizant about protecting our back or our posterior chain. So there's a lot of ways to incorporate into our exercise, into our routines with our clients. There's a lot of ways is to comfortably apply exercise for the upper back without straining or injuring clients or without them being bored or feeling like they've failed. Um, and you can incorporate this again by applying simple activation techniques at the beginning of a workout or a program and then building incrementally from there. Uh, Sarah did mention, you know, a two to one ratio for back to front. That is sort of an adage that we've had, I think, at least since I've been in the industry. There's nothing wrong with that adage. I think that's perfectly fine, but it's also probably just important to sneak in as much posterior exercise as you can, depending on what uh, you're comfortable is, is comfortable with physically, but also comfortable with in regards to their expectations. Right. Good, good. And Abby, 50 plus. Hit us. Hit us yeah. So <laughs> here we go. I know. I love. So I, so really 
if we're trying to develop our glutes, first we go back to, yes, we want them to activate. We know we're all in agreement of that, about that. Um, but they probably shouldn't be training their glutes. And I know we've got a lot of coaches and, and co instructors on this, on this webinar. They probably shouldn't be training their glutes more than like two, three times a week. That's first. And I, I'm not going to even ask the question, but like how many instructors, you know, teach, you know, eight classes a week. And in those classes, like five to six of them, they're doing glute training because people want more. And that's, you know, that's the way we sustain ourselves. We make a living that way. So we've got to do all this glute training. It's challenging for us because we're not giving our chance ourselves a chance to recover. But in addition to that, as we get older, we know that we have muscle loss. And one of the ways to prevent muscle loss is by doing strength training, particularly strength training that's a little heavier. That's a little heavier. I was, I, you know, I keep recommending this to so many people. And heavier is again, we know that's relative. It's a relative term. It's doing true strength training versus muscular endurance training. If you're trying to maintain your muscle mass, you have to do true strength training versus always doing muscular endurance training. So, you know, we can get into how many reps that is because each person is going to be different just based on their own fitness level. Some people say it's up to 12 reps. Some people say it's up to 10 reps. Some will say it's up to 15 reps, but whatever the, whatever the number is that you should be fatiguing by that point, like you can't lift anymore. And it's not that I know so many people are worried that they're going to get bigger. By the way, that cracks me up because now everybody wants a big butt. Like everybody wants, not everybody, but there's like a huge, you know, there's a movement to, ever, to have a big Kardashian butt. All right. We know that's not even a real butt, by the way. But if you are trying to hypertrophy the muscle, you've got to lift a little heavier. That's one. But even if you're trying to maintain your muscle mass, you have to go a little bit heavier. And with my clients, I do encourage them to go heavier, but I know a lot of them, when we say heavy, you know, maybe you're doing a heavier deadlift, but really how much can your back stand? Because for me, because of my injuries, my glutes can handle a lot, but my lower back can't handle it. So I have to modify the movement to load one side, maybe a little more and take some of the load off of my lower back. So there's lots of ways that we can, I can show you those movements, you know, as we, as we progress through this, this oh, webinar, but I some ideas to get to, to lift yeah. Would you, do you mind, Abby? Would you, yeah. show, she put on the tights, man. We got to use it. Put on pants for this, everybody. I was, I normally yeah. wear like pajama pants and you can't see them because yeah. we're just Don't talking, but and I, yeah. can you hear it? Can you yeah, totally hear him? No, oh, you're doing fine. It's fine. Okay, good. And then I'm going to, you won't hope, hope you might not be able to hear me back here, but my favorite exercise to activation. I love doing a single leg glute bridge. We know most of the time that doesn't require any weight. That's one. So that's a no load muscular endurance exercise all for activation. I love doing single leg squats. That's another huge glute activator. My favorite exercise though, is a single leg deadlift. So if you were doing a bilateral deadlift as an example, so you've got a slight knee bend, you're moving at the hip with the spine in a neutral position. And I had somebody say, pretend you're taking your pants off and you're pulling pants back up. That's the movement. Now for me, I could, my, my glutes and my lower body can handle, I mean, a, probably a couple hundred pounds, but my lower back would blow. It would be done. So how do I modify that? I do single leg version. So I'm going to turn my camera down a little bit. I'm going to grab my weight with my mismatch weights. So what I might do is a kickstand leg kickstand, and I'm putting all the weight onto one leg. I might do it here with a kickstand leg. I might do it ready for this here with one leg up. I might do it. Wait, there's more with one foot pressed up against the wall, elevated. So now what you're doing, what I like about that is you're taking you're progressing. Yes. I really like that. Uh, you're, exactly. You're I do that with my clients. So I, I, I slow the movement down. I start there. I see what they're, you know, I start bilaterally and then we gradually move to unilateral. And then we might progress from unilateral with that kickstand foot to maybe lifting the foot or putting the foot up on an elevated surface. So we gradually progress it as long as they're feeling they're maintaining the integrity of the movement. Okay. So but like I would do, because my goal is to get Abby's butt, me and, and like half the people on the call. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my deadlift with both feet on the ground is, and then I'm going to go into a kickstand and then yeah. I could put my foot on the wall and then I could take my foot off the wall. And then I'm engaging a lot of balance 
it's, tons of balance. Yeah, it, and it's that balance, the balance part of it also, because your glutes, your glutes really do we even talk about what their function is. Your glutes function, number one, hip extension, huge. So your glutes function when you run, when you come out of a squat, you know, when you deadlift, hip extension. So first of all, what's hip extension? It's this hip extension. The other thing that your glutes do primarily is they stabilize the pelvis and the lumbar spine. So if you come back to this, if you're do, doing movements on a single leg, and tell me if I'm yelling at you now, but if you're doing movements on a single leg, what happens is not only when you're doing that hip extension is the glute firing, hopefully, but also the glutes are stabilizing in that movement. They're stabilizing everything down the chain, up the chain. So your glutes really um, have, a, they just have so much to do with total function in your body. So I love that. I love that. That's one of my favorite, my favorite exercises to do. Um, for me, as I said, I could probably go heavier with the weight, but what happens is two things, my hands, my hands, I can't hold the weight. I literally can't hold the weight. It gets that heavy, but also because I have disc issues because of the injury, I can't put a load on, I can't put that load on my lower back. So what I do is I take half the weight and I put it on one leg. Voila. Yeah, it's great. That, that really helps. And that's good for me to do. And I think what other, what people also don't realize, like you talked about the posterior chain, and if you don't work your lats, you're not going to engage the erector spinae, you're not going to go into your QL, you're not going to, you, you know, you want to feed it all the way down. Um, I, I look at that and, and you know what happens because of my left hip, my left knee gets screwed up Yeah, and it stopped because it wasn't able to really straighten out the back of the leg, my knee started falling in and then I damaged my cartilage and my meniscus. So right, right, right. If, if we don't maintain this strength and this integrity of the gluteal and the whole posterior chain, the risk of injury is really, really accentuated. Um, Andrew, can I was I was fascinated by the idea of the foam rolling because into you know I was talking about how I see a physical therapist um I should see a mental therapist but I see a physical therapist for my knee right now because I'm trying to get it back I got PRP shots um in my knee um and I'm seeing the physical therapist and she has me rolling out and I frankly I was a little bit surprised so I know you moved some stuff around in your your home so that we could see some of your foam rolling or some of the um the uh uh training that you do can you show us some of the some of the fascia work oh uh, you know what I don't have any tools in here well that's not true I have a uh, massager from 1958 right there but I feel like <laughs> if I use it it's going to break under the weight of my body so uh -huh. um, I do also have a thigh master from 81 though if you guys want to see me use that I've no, never taken it out of the box okay. so Okay. But um, in I don't, I don't have any of my fascia tools in my office. Um, but I do have, I can demonstrate a couple of my favorite, uh, sort of activation. Of course, this is all very subjective to who you're training, whether it's an activation exercise or the exercise, but I do have a few posterior chain exercises that I've learned from my yoga, um, practice that, uh, I can demonstrate if we're interested in that. That would be great. Please. Yeah. Stand by. Here we go. So, um, as we spoke about, activating a lot of the posterior chain is going to help us with our daily function, not just including the glutes, but of course, our lower back, our upper back, and our head. And we see a lot of clients who, for example, when we ask them to hinge at the hip, this happens no matter what. So, how do we get them to? come into this position? Well, my first word of advice, especially if we're new to fitness and training is do not expect it to happen soon at all. Um, whilst you're doing that, try to deliver as much feeling of success to that particular client as possible. And part of doing that is not giving them all of the pointers at once on day one. Part of that is simply trying to work them into being, being able to feel the certain parts of their body, being able to engage certain muscles that they didn't even know they had and being able to stretch other muscles. Now, foam rolling or massage balls on the front of the chest and the stomach 
is um, not the easiest thing to get a client to do. However, if you do see me at SCW Mania in California, we're going to do a, a functional fascia, fascia session, and we are going to roll down the abs and across the chest. So I'll show you when we're there. Now, this is one of two. Can we see me okay here? Uh-huh. All right. So those of you who do practice yoga, you've got your cobra, right? And I know for one, when I started practicing yoga, I thought Cobra was me pushing on my arms. One of the ways I get my clients to activate their upper back and their mid back is by putting them in a push-up position or a chaturanga position, if you practice yoga, having them pull their palms away from the ground. So firstly, they're already engaging their upper back, their rhomboids and their mid trap. Of course, they might want to drive up to their ears. So I'm going to help them. I'm putting my finger right here between their shoulder blades so they can squeeze down, hopefully. And once their hands are off the ground, then I ask them to lift their chest away as best they can. You're also going to have them trying to lift their heads up a lot. That's not necessary. If they want to, and you have to tell them 12 times, just let them do it. They're probably not going to hurt themselves. But I stare here in front of me on the floor. I squeeze my upper back, and I take a break. Short sweet and repeat. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be a, a 40 second hold. If we can do it five times at the beginning of a workout, then hopefully I've helped them to activate their upper back muscles and to get a feel of putting that little arch into their back. Now, another one of the practices I do to help them find a neutral position in their core, and we could do a whole session on using various language, right? I hope in the future I can do more sessions about using various language to help initiate certain movements or engagements with certain populations. But one of the things I like to use a lot here to get people out of this position, maybe have them come into a little bit of a hip tilt, bring their head back and brace their core as I put the imaginary campfire underneath their stomach and then I put the imaginary Indiana Jones spiked ceiling right above their back. So hopefully when I do that, and this turns out to be pretty effective most of the time, at least from my experience, they'll pull their core in, but not by pulling their back away. Instead, they'll brace their core a little bit more and they'll keep their back neutral and flat. The last thing I'll say about this, um, Les Mills did some research years ago on the effectiveness, the effectiveness of using engage or brace to get people to brace their core. And they used actual like electrode monitors to see how well people engage their abs based on that, that cue. And as you can imagine, brace did a good job of getting people to squeeze in. Mm. That was the only difference between the control group and the test group was using the word brace or engage. And brace goes a long way. And then hopefully over time, you'll get them from this to this, but it's going to take a while because they've probably spent 55 years like this. So keep that in mind. Yeah. And in my case, a little bit longer. <laughs> um, and uh, Abby, you brought up a wonderful article that was written by our friend Len Kravitz. Um, and can you talk about that exercise? He wrote a phenomenal article, you said? Phenomenal. It's amazing. I thought I, and I, and it's funny because it just came out and I was just kind of, it just, you know, just so happened that I was looking through it today and, and here I am doing this um, webinar. Yeah. There were so many great, you know, it's so easy, so easy to understand some great little tidbits of information in there. Um, you know, first of all, it goes into the role of the glutes. What do the glutes do? I mean, that's, that's first, I love that piece of it but how we train our glutes and certain things that we need to do to get them to engage more. I think one of them, I love this, is that you actually get more glute engagement. And I, you just made me think about this. When you abdominal brace, when you brace and when you do abdominal hollowing, both. I know we were like, don't do hollow. But when you do those, you actually get more glute engagement. I was like, okay, love that. Hallelujah. That was one. And then they also went through, you know, the different, um, like the different movements, the different exercises that gave you the best activation. Um, one of them, I just love it. The one of them is called this is the glute bridge, the single leg glute bridge. I think everybody loves to hear that because it's a simple one that most people can do. Even if you can't get down the ground, you could have them do it on um, a massage table or on a bench. So that's one. The other one is the single leg squat. 
And they always say, start with a bilateral movement, start with the bilateral squat first for your beginners and then progress to single leg. And, and if you want, I'll show you a really great way to get people to do a better single leg squat. And then the third exercise, and I hope I'm getting all this right, but I'll share it with you guys later, um, is <laughs> ready for this donkey kick. And I joke being donkey kick, but in a, in a quadruped position, hip extension, where you're lifting and lowering your leg up to, up to the ceiling, everybody, like if I joke, anybody over 40, you've done the exercise. Don't tell me you have it. So I'm like, I mean, I was, I, I've been doing that exercise. I was like 10 years old. Yes. I'm neurotic. So I was watching love boat. And doing that exercise in front of the television. So those three exercises, look based on what I'm looking at, it looks like they got the most glute activation of all exercises. That's wonderful. So, show them. I want to see that also. Okay, let me show you this the right. So yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the the so so single so doing a bilateral squat. We know that a lot of people can't do a single leg. Um, they want to do a single leg, but they can't, they physically can't do it. And the reason they can't do it is most of the time as a group instructor, um, we introduced, we introduced bilateral squat and we rarely progress it from bilateral, bilateral correctly to a single leg. And so what we do is we go from bilateral and we immediately have them lift one leg up with the same weights in their hands and try to do a single leg. Now, this is what it looks like typically in my class if I do it like that. So I might be here. Here's my, what I'm, and I'm modifying my squat. So here's my squat. And I say, okay, everybody, single leg. And they lift one leg. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it looks like this. Like there's, Abby, then there's, Abby, can yeah. you scoot a little back away from the oven? Because your name is covering up your feet. Back, back, the other way. Okay. No, no, back, back away back, from kind of like to the left. Way. Yes, there you go. Perfect. Show me again, please. <laughs> So you start, you start your squat here and then people, what I notice is they go immediately to single leg and then it looks kind of like this or this because what you're introducing in single leg squat is extra load because you've now just taken all of your body weight that you was distributed between two legs and you put it on one that's one along with the same amount of weight you're holding external weight and it's a balance challenge right. so you really need to layer in those progressions so the way that i do it again and i'll show you really quick is i start here bilateral then i say feet more narrow start here okay now Kickstand next. So it's the same, it's the same dynamics. It's and the it, same biomechanics. And, and it can yes. But there's one last piece. Then I say get down to the bottom. Now lift your foot. Lower your foot. Stand. Then I say down. Lift your foot. Come up. Lower your foot. Get your lowest range of motion with your spine in neutral because your glutes don't work well when you're around it. You need to be in a neutral spine. Lift your foot, stand, lower your foot. So less balance challenge, maybe the same amount of load. And then eventually they will go from this lift up and hold. And then they're able to do the full range of motion on a single leg. So that's how I progress it in my, in, with my classes, with pretty much everybody. So I, I, I start with that little, you know, that, that, that little kickstand, it always works. So you right. distribute your weight onto one and, leg and, and then so, add some balance. Because you're tiny, you know, when you go back, just so everybody understands, a kickstand is basically when you lift your, your heel up and yes. you sit on the ball and toes, the ball and toes. And you can even yes. modify and grow your kickstand. You can go to the yeah. ball of the foot and the toes. Then you can go to the top of the toes. Then you could put your yeah. foot... You can put your foot on top of the other foot. So you possibly, can, yeah. yeah, you can All just of kind of inch your way into it. Yes. And I, and I say to my class, the cue that I use is get as much weight as you can on your stable leg, put as much weight. So take as much weight off of the kickstand foot and get that weight onto your stable leg as much as you can, because everybody's going to be different. And it, yeah, it, 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 it seems it seems to be working. 
We got it. We've got it. We've gotten a couple questions. Um, the Len Kravitz article is phenomenal, and it was published in Ideas Magazine. I think you got to be you have to be a member with them. But yeah. what I'm going to do is I'll contact Amy uh, Thompson, and hopefully she'll let us publish it, and we'll put the the link in there for you guys, so that when you get the recording, we'll have the link for you because I think it's such a phenomenal. It really is a phenomenal resource. Um, so Susan, we will do it. And yes, Gail loves the donkey kick. Um, Andrew, you were showing some other exercises. Um, uh, do you have any other, like your little favorites that you like to build up with your clients? Yeah, um, I think Abby and I both share the love for this. So Abby, maybe you can uh, cue me, you can coach me and I'll do our hip extension. Yeah. This is our favorite. <laughs> One of the reasons it's my favorite, pardon me, is that, it, it's still possible to do this wrong, right? So keep that in mind. It's always possible to do something wrong and we need to help our clients visualize these movements just as much as we need to help them actually do them. But this move helps to engage the glutes without a load on my spine, without a load on my shoulders, without worrying about balance. And furthermore, this hip extension I'm about to do maintains resistance on my hip extensors throughout the whole movement. Whereas when I'm doing a squat, the resistance or the extension rather on my hip extensors shortens as I come to the top. So there's a couple ways you can do hip extensions. I'll let Abby coach me through a few modifications here. Okay, ready? Here we go. So first, uh, bring both feet together because <clears throat> it is even when you lift your leg, there's still that element of balance. And then pull your right knee towards your chest. You got to love that. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, Perfect. Keeping the knee bent. And then, yeah. And then press through your heel, your toes, all tight, all three, all five, all three, all three, like you're a sloth, all five toes. And then before you come up, activate your glutes, fire your glutes. You have to, because a lot of people don't feel their glutes. They feel hamstrings and lower back. So first engage your glutes, even if you have to do a slight posterior tilt to the pelvis, as long as it doesn't bother your back and then drive your hips directly up. And I say, yeah, drive it. Exactly. Extending your hips, squeezing your butt, and then come back down to the floor, trying to maintain neutral pelvis if you can. But some people need that little posterior tilt just to get the glute to activate. So I'm not against doing that at all. And you want to try to come straight up and then straight down. And if you don't feel your glute, Andrew, what you can do is you can change where your foot is in relation to your body. So maybe, maybe move your foot a little closer to your body or a little farther away from your body, but try different places to see where you feel your glute. Cause sometimes it has to do with maybe there's tightness in the quadricep muscle or tightness in the hip flexor that's inhibiting the glute from engaging and extending the hip to get your hip up. Nice that work. That worked already. Oh God. Um, but that's, that's great. And that was, you said, Abby, that was one of Len Kravitz's like favorite all time it, exercises. Yeah, it says it like, it just goes through the it goes through the, you know, the, the amount of activation. I don't know how they, I can't remember. I, I kind of, you know, glossed through it, but they go through like, if I ready or like that, like they go through like, like exercises yeah, and they go through the percentage of activation. Yeah. So, um, well, so it, it goes through. A, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. He's at university of New Mexico. So they, it's kind of like icky, but they put little, you know, electrodes on you to measure your butt contraction. It's, it's, it's very intimate. Okay. But that's how they, right. measure, they activate. Oh, you know, okay. You know what happened? Because I was talking, it pinned me and it didn't pin Andrew on the exercises. That's why nobody could see him doing it. Well, it felt good. Um, let me, well, do me to do it really fast. Do it really fast, Abby, while you're, okay. Uh, okay. you are know it. Yeah, I'll Thank keep talking. You. Nobody, nobody talk for a second. So it, there's a cat bowl on the ground there. Nobody can normally see that. All right, cat bowl. So you're lying on your back. I start with the feet together just to make sure that you're symmetrical. Good. Maybe open the heels and the toes to sit bones distance, arms down, pressing your arms into the floor. Pull one knee into your chest, keeping the knee bent or in towards your rib cage. And then drive through the other heel and big toe and pinky toe and press your butt up toward the ceiling. 
And you want to, again, if you have to do a slight posterior tilt to the pelvis, you can see what I just did there where my back came down. The goal is to activate the glute first and then lift up. So just a little activation. I don't have, you can see I've got really tight hip flexors and quads. Um, long story. But anyway, you want to try to get that straight line from your knees to your hip all the way to your rib cage. And the top leg is just coming along for the ride. That's awesome. That's great stuff. And perfect timing. Of course, we've hit the 45 minute mark. I'm just going to share with you. We've got a wonderful conference coming up in California. Um, and you guys know we get 20 CECs. We have a, over 130 sessions. This is wonderful. Um, and I'm going to show our video that our wonderful designer created, Adam. <laughs> certification smash that's going to be just in May, May 19th through 21st. Um, this will give you a little idea of what we have to offer. great. And um, I somehow can't get back. I can't get back to shutting off my screen share. So I apologize for that. Um, there we go. So I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Abby, for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Adam, thank you for creating our wonderful videos. And thank you for running this webinar. We'll try to get that article for you guys. Everybody have a wonderful night. Thank you so much.